past five and a half decades, the Ford Mustang nameplate has been an American icon that has consistently been in Ford's U.S. lineup for around 56 years. Now, of course, in recent years, we've seen a lot of movement with electrification and self-driving, and it's forcing a lot of legacy auto manufacturers to completely reinvent themselves, and Ford, of course, is no different. Which is why for 2021, Ford is introducing an all-new member of the Mustang family. This is the all-new 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E, an all-electric SUV that is designed to go head-to-head -head with Tesla and their Model 3-based Model Y crossover. The new Mach-E is designed to deliver the type of driving that a lot of modern American families want, with two available sizes to its battery pack, available dual motors so you get all-wheel drive, and a new performance version dubbed the Mach-E GT, which should be able to do 0-60 to in around 3.5 half seconds when it goes on sale this summer. Now this week, Ford has loaned me the model that probably a lot of consumers are gonna end up buying. This is the Mach-E extended range with the dual motor system, which means it has all wheel drive, which means it can go up to 270 miles on a full charge. And Ford says it'll do zero to 60 in around 4.8 seconds. So as the newest member of the Mustang family, is the all new Mach-E a worthy challenger to Tesla's Model Y? Stay tuned to find out. Now, about two years ago at the Los Angeles Auto Show, Ford finally took the wraps off of this all new electric variation of the Mustang. And of course, a lot of enthusiasts were upset about the fact that Ford is using the Mustang name to show off their all new electric crossover. Remember, unlike their previous attempts like the C-Max plug-in or the Ford Focus Electric, which were compliance electric vehicles, this vehicle was designed to be a battery electric vehicle from the ground up. It has a skateboard platform where the batteries line up the floor, so it's mounted nice and low. And Ford basically had Tesla right in their line of sight when they were developing this vehicle. And they started development about four years ago when CEO uh, at Ford back then basically told the design team, think Mustang when you're designing this all new version. So let's talk about the styling of this Mach-E first, because obviously this is where a lot of you are going to make that connection to the Mach-E. And the beauty about this vehicle is there's not a single Ford logo on this car, which is kind of a good thing because the Ford logo has somewhat of an uncool look to it, especially with younger buyers. So instead, we have the Mustang running horse right here at the front and center of the grill. The car obviously, as you can see, doesn't actually have or need a grill, but the grill is slightly different based on the trim level. This one here is the premium model. So you kind of have this mustache look to the actual grill with this black outline. The one that I prefer actually is the GT model, which has kind of a fake grill which takes up the entire front end it kind of reminds me of the way the Tesla Model S looked before they refreshed it. That's probably the one that I would go with. I also like these Mustang inspired headlights. These are a full LED design. You have LED daytime running lights, LED turn signals, which are actually sequential. And then down here, you can see there are some active grill shutters, which do help, of course, with cooling, with aerodynamics. Overall, let me know in the comments below what you think of the design of the all new Mach-E. I think it actually works and compared to its main competitor, the Tesla Model Y, which looks a little bit frumpy. It looks like a swollen up Model 3 at times. This to me looks sleek. It looks a lot more modern. It's going to definitely tr attract a lot of stares, especially in certain colors. White is probably not my choice. I would go for the grabber blue that they also offer on the Ford Mustang. Now, of course, being an electric vehicle, this also has a frunk, which means because there's no V8 engine underneath here, you can open up the frunk and Ford says you get around. I guess I can't open this from here. <laughs> Wait. Is this on the key fob even? That's really weird. Okay. So I thought that I could open up the frunk from here. I thought that was a button, but it's clearly not a button. Sometimes they hide it over here. And I was thinking maybe I could open it from the fob. However, there's no actual button here to open up the frunk. So I need to actually run inside the vehicle and pull the hood latch. And it's kind of like a BMW where you have to actually pull the hood latch twice. But once you open up the frunk, you're not going to find a V8 or a V6 or an EcoBoost floor stroller because remember, this is a full EV. So instead, Ford gives you a nice frunk here, which measure, measures around 4.7 cubic feet. I also like this little divider that they've put in here to kind of help organize all your stuff. Tesla does not do that. There's also a drain at the bottom of this, so you could technically use this as a cooler. Uh, the entire frunk itself is sealed, so this area here will stay wet or dry, depending on, you know, if you guys are using it as a cooler or whatnot. And you can see here, I have the charger in this vehicle. With an electric vehicle, you're probably wondering how does it charge and how quickly does it charge? Well, this is the mobile charger that Ford gives you that's included. It's, of course, it's a standard uh, level one charger. Uh, hooks up to a standard 110 household outlet. Ford also gives you the option where you could swap out the end of the plug and plug in a level two charger. This will actually charge at a maximum of around 
10 and a half kilowatts on the Ford charger, which is nice because when you have it plugged into a level two at your home, it'll charge at a rate of 30 miles an hour uh, versus a level one, which will charge at around four miles an hour. The charge port is actually over here on the side, on the driver's side. I like how Ford actually put it at the front of the vehicle as opposed to the rear like Tesla does. And you can see DC fast charging is gonna be standard. The Mach-E has the ability to DC fast charge at up to 150 kilowatts, which means you can add around 52 miles in 10 minutes or go from zero to 80% charge in about 45 minutes. Not technically as fast as some of the newer Teslas, which can charge at 270 kilowatts, but Ford did say they should be able to increase that with over-the-air updates in the coming years. Now, what about the powertrain? Since we have the hood open, this is usually where I would talk about what's powering a Mustang, but this vehicle here is the extended range battery for $5,000 extra, and it's also all-wheel drive, which means it has dual motors. This vehicle, remember, is rear-wheel drive, and when you add the dual motor version, it adds another motor at the front to give you all-wheel drive. This one here makes a total of 346 horsepower and 428 pound-feet of torque. This is one step below the GT version. Of course, you guys can also get a single motor with rear drive. The base model will have around 266 horsepower. Uh, the extended range battery pack ex increases the power to around 290. At most, in terms of the range, the Mach-E will go a total of 305 miles on the extended range California Route 1 edition model, which is slightly less than what you're gonna get from a Tesla Model Y, which, which can do around 326 miles total. Now, the reason being is the Mach-E is technically not as efficient as a Tesla. Uh, the MPGE rating vehicle rating for this vehicle is around 90 MPGE. Compare that to a Model Y dual motor non-performance, which will get around 125 MPGE. So I'll talk about that, of course, later on as you go into the driving scene of this vehicle. The battery size of the extended range is around 88 kilowatt hours. That is the usable um, usage, of course. Ford limits your capacity that you can actually use to try to preserve the life of the battery, uh, which is a total of 98 kilowatt hours, which is actually pretty large. This is around you know, 20% larger than what you're gonna get on the biggest battery for the Tesla Model Y. Now, weight is also an issue, which is why this is not quite as efficient. mach are pretty heavy. This one here, as it sits, weighs in at around 4,800 pounds. That's about 1,000 pounds heavier versus the last Mustang Shelby GT500 that I drove, and also around 500 pounds heavier than its main competitor, the Model Y. So I'm not entirely sure why the mach -E is so heavy, but Despite that, of course, with 350 horsepower nearly, this should do zero to 60 in around 4.8 seconds. If you guys want more speed, the GT version will shave that down to around three and a half seconds. Now this is an SUV, so in case you guys are wondering what does it tow, Ford actually didn't recommend towing for this vehicle. And remember, it uses a single speed reduction gear transmission, so there's no CVT, there's no actual gears. That's how it works with an electric motor. But let's shut the hood and let's Go into the rest of the side profile of this vehicle, which I actually didn't shut the hood properly. You have to kind of come over here and slam it down just like a Tesla. Now let's look at the side profile of this vehicle because Ford did some nice trickery here with the design. And I think they did a really great job with making this vehicle again, resemble a Mustang, but also it resembles kind of like a coupified SUV, kind of like a uh, Model Y. Now in terms of the overall length, the Mach-E is around 185.6 inches long. This is actually about two inches shorter than the current generation Mustang. The big difference, of course, the wheelbase is 117 inches long, which is 10 inches longer. That's gonna give you significantly more space on the inside and the Mach-E's height. This is around 64 inches tall, which makes it around 10 inches taller versus a regular Mustang. So again, from the side profile, you're not gonna distinguish this as part of the Mustang family. It just looks like every one of those coupified uh, SUVs, which is kind of the styling trend nowadays. Now let's look at the wheel sizes of the vehicle. Uh, a 19 inch wheel is gonna be standard. These are the wheels that you get on the premium package model for around $4,000 extra to go to the premium model. They're wrapped in 225 with tires, which are actually pretty skinny. Ford went with that, of course, to give us a slightly better range. These are gonna be a little bit lighter and a little bit more aerodynamic. The GT version will have a 20 inch wheel with a 20 millimeter fatter tire, which of course, which is going to improve the handling of this vehicle. Now, you saw earlier the charge port is over here on the driver's side at the front of the vehicle. And technically, there is one Ford logo on the windshield over here that I kind of missed. Uh, that's really the only one that I've seen on the vehicle aside from the actual glass. Uh, that's the only one that's really gonna stand out. And then it, you can see above uh, the, the car, a standard panoramic sunroof is right here. Although this roof does not open, it's basically just a glass roof. Uh, the roof itself is very darkly tinted, which is similar to what Tesla does. There's no interior sunshade for it. Um, so you're kind of stuck with the sun beating down on you, but thankfully I found it to be very dark tinted, so it doesn't really affect me. Also, I love the trickery that Ford is doing here 
uh, with the side profile. You can see here the roof line of this vehicle looks like it stops over here, but it's actually a little bit higher. You can see here uh, Ford painted this area black. It does improve the headroom of this vehicle, which we'll talk about as we get into the back seat. Now, speaking of which, you're probably also noticing, noticing on the side, where are the door handles of this vehicle? You can see here there are some uh, release electronic buttons here. If I push this button here, it actually pushes the door out slightly. And once I push the button, the door actually can't be closed. I have to pull it out with this little handle here, which is nice, and then it'll allow me to close it. So if you kind of open this at first and are wondering, can I slam my finger here? It won't let you do that until you actually pull the door open. Now the rear door doesn't actually have a door handle here. So instead what Ford did is they, when you come here to open the rear door, there's a nice completely padded area right here where I can get in and try to put my rest my finger here to open the door. I think that's very clever because as you guys know, door handles, kind of affect the aerodynamics. They affect the entire look of the car. So it looks even more sleek by doing it this way. And I find it easier to use those door handles versus the ones you find on the Model Y where you have to push them in uh, first. Now looking at the rear of the vehicle, you see a lot of Mustang influence back here. As you can see, uh, the taillights specifically, these are the tri-bar taillights that you get on every Mustang model with sequential LED uh, turn signals, which is very nice. They are full LED design. I also like the kind of clear lens look to the actual taillights. You can see the Mustang running a horse is right there at the back of the vehicle. And then down here, you can see the reverse lights are down there uh, and there's some more piano black plastic trim. I like how Ford didn't go too crazy, of course, with the cladding. This vehicle is supposed to be an SUV, but it only offers 5.7 inches of ground clearance, which is actually like a half an inch less than what you get on the Model Y. So don't even think about taking this vehicle off-roading. It's designed to be a road going kind of electric SUV. Now opening up the trunk area of this vehicle, you can see an electric power tailgate is going to be included on this model. And because it's an SUV, you get pretty decent amount of cargo space. In addition to the 4.7 you get at the front, there's around 29.9 uh, over here with the second row seats up. If you fold down the second row seats, which surprisingly, there's no release lever here. I'm surprised that Ford didn't do that. Ford says you get around 59 cubic feet of space, which is around uh, eight cubic feet less than what you're gonna get from that Tesla Model Y. Now, besides the interesting door handles on the Mach-E, Ford is also introducing their phone as a key system, which is very similar to, again, what Tesla does. So all you have to do when you own the vehicle is you download the Ford Pass app, which Ford actually gave me access to it uh, for this review. I've basically set up my phone as a key and it works via Bluetooth, which is similar to what other manufacturers do. I believe Tesla does, uses it a different way. Um, now, in case you guys are wondering what happens if I didn't bring the, the key, uh, or if my phone dies. Now, of course, there's several different ways where you can get in. Now, Ford does offer an actual physical hard key for the vehicle. You can see there's the key for it. It is very basic looking and it's the older uh, Ford key. It doesn't even have the Mustang running horse on. You can't even open the lift gate or the front from the key fob. So this is pretty basic. It's kind of similar to Tesla's key card. Now, of course, when I wanna lock the vehicle, there's a lock button here which if I push that, it'll basically lock the vehicle for me. Uh, and of course, in traditional Ford fashion, there are those little num numerical keypads. So if I wanted to, I can input a code here, which will unlock the door for me, or I can also go into the Ford Pass app, which if I go into the Ford app, you can see here, it shows you exactly what the car, the state of charge for the car, the mileage on the car, and I can unlock and lock it and start it. I can even roll the windows up and down. So all I have to do is kind of push and hold the unlock button here. And it should communicate and talk to the vehicle and eventually unlock the doors, which it was working perfectly earlier. But as you guys know with technology, it doesn't always work. But technically, because I have my phone as a key set up, I can just open the door because I have my phone near the vehicle and it senses that. But once you get inside, you can see that Ford really made the interior of the Mach-E completely different than any other Ford vehicle that you've ever seen. And this is a very good thing considering the new audience that Ford's going to be attracting with this all new version. Let me first shut the door. The door has a relatively solid sounding thunk. It actually sounds better than the last Tesla Model Y that I tested, so I really am happy with that impression of quality. And I have to admit, this interior, I didn't really care for it at first. When I first saw it at the LA Auto Show, as you can see, there's a massive 15 and a half inch touchscreen here. There's another 10 and a quarter inch screen over here, which is nice because Tesla doesn't give you that. And once you get inside the vehicle, unlike Tesla's where you can kind of just put your foot on the brake and start it, Ford actually does give you a dedicated power button here. So put your foot on the brake, push the power button, you can see it turns on. It even has its own unique chime, or at least a new chime that I happen to hear in other Ford products, and it sounds much better. It feels a lot more modern, a lot more futuristic, and just a lot more minimalistic. And this is really where the industry is going. People like this kind of minimalistic look. Even the dashboard of this vehicle is completely uh, low for this car. So you can kind of see out of the outside very well. The pillars here are actually a lot thinner than I am. Uh, 
anticipated it would be, so the visibility is very good. The seats are also extremely comfortable. These are what Ford calls Active X, which is a uh, fake leather uh, material. It's very soft and comfortable. This is kind of the space gray color, which is kind of more similar to white in its, in its color. I think the seats are comfortable, supportive. They are three level heated. You also have a heated steering wheel. And on the driver's side here, they are 10 way power adjustable with three person memory. And you can also adjust between different driver profiles, which is kind of similar to what Tesla does again. So this is all very much a copy of, you know, the last Tesla that I tested, which is kind of a good thing because it's completely different and it's what people are looking for here in the industry. Now let's take a look at the steering wheel here. You can see there's the running horse right there, front and center. Um, there's some steering wheel controls here for the Ford Copilot 360. No paddles or anything like that. This vehicle doesn't have paddles for regen braking. Instead, you can either turn on and off the one pedal drive through the actual screen. And you can see here, there's a bunch of sensors here and cameras because this vehicle does come with their Ford Active Drive prep package, which is going to be similar to, to Cadillac and GM Super Cruise, where it'll allow for true hands-free driving. That is not available just yet. Ford says that'll come in an over-the-air update, uh, but those that's what kind of what the sensors are there for. I really like the way this interior is laid out, and in terms of the materials, let's talk about that because Tesla isn't really known for offering great material quality, but let's see what the Ford does. Now, this carbon fiber here is fake. I kind of wish that Ford just went with a aluminum trim here instead of the fake carbon fiber. This right here is part of the speaker system, although it's just kind of a cloth covering for the 10 speaker Bang & Olufsen stereo. I think this looks very modern and upscale. The upper portion here of the dash is hard touch plastic, but in terms of the fit and finish, it actually is finished off pretty well. You can see there's more ActiveX on the dashboard over here, on the lower part of the dash, on the door panels, it's all soft touch injection molded plastic with more of that ActiveX material. The window controls have a pretty high quality tactile feel and they are one touch automatic up down for all four. Uh, you have power folding mirrors, which is a very nice feature to have as well. The one thing I'm noticing in terms of build quality, now my tester is a pretty early pre-production model. There are a couple of switches in here that feel a little bit flimsy, so I'm gonna have to wait until I actually test one that is you know, a, a later production model to see if they uh, have addressed that for kind of delayed the production of this vehicle because they were trying to work out all the kinks. Now, speaking of which, let's go over here to the massive tablet screen. Now, it keeps giving me an error because my phone is not charging on the wireless phone charger there. Um, but this, of course, is part of the new Sync 4A inf infotainment system. It, is it was developed and updated exclusively for this vehicle. You can see uh, there is a little bit of a learning curve for this car. You can see every time you push the Mustang uh, icon over there, this is what brings you brings up all your different controls between the drive modes. As you guys know, there's Engage, Whisper, and Unbridled. Uh, Unbridled is the sport setting, basically. Engage is the normal setting, and then Whisper is the calmly and quiet eco setting, as you can as Ford likes to call it. Uh, it's kind of interesting that they use those names. It all has to do with the running horse badge, but I think just a simpler mode or a simpler name would have probably sufficed. You can also access all of your different cameras. You can see there's the full 360 camera this car offers, which is included on the premium model. The graphics are good. This car also offers the active park assist, so it'll parallel park and perpendicular park itself, which is again, uh, pretty nice to have. You'll also find that on its uh, main competing, competing vehicles. And then of course, clicking this out, you can see this is the way the screen is oriented to look. And it also includes features like wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Now, speaking of which, the wireless CarPlay. I really wanna show you what that looks like and it was working earlier when I first paired my phone, but as you can see, it is paired to my phone right now and that is the screen that is coming up. It's not working at all and I was hoping that it would work so I could show you guys the screen. Ford says that it's a problem with Apple, but then of course I feel like Apple is gonna point the finger at Ford. So a couple of kinks here, but this is all going to be sorted out as we get more wire wireless over the air updates. Now let's go to the GPS for this vehicle because this is a feature that a lot of electric vehicle owners use. This is the Ford GPS system. It has been updated, although I kind of wish it had a little bit more color in it, like a contrast color, as opposed to it looks a little bit too similar to the rest of the screen's color. You can also go to a night mode here where you can get rid of the white and replace it with a black background. I have it in an automatic setting right now. This also is gonna help you find all your different charging stations. So again, you can kind of go over there to where to, and it'll show you all your different charging stations. It'll show you level two and DC fast chargers that are all in the area. So that's very important to have. It's very similar to Tesla. And Ford also does it where if you plan a route and you need to stop to charge, the system will basically send you to chargers on your route so you don't really have to think about it, which is kind of the way uh, Tesla does that. Now this screen itself definitely is massive. I like the way, I like the size of it. I also like the orientation of it, but I did find that it is a little bit slow to respond at times. I mean, if I, you know, push, 
icons there, you can see it takes a second for it to actually engage. And I really wanna show you guys the CarPlay, but as you can see, every time I show you the CarPlay, it shows me that darn black screen, which would be really nice to show you guys that. And just like that, with any technology, the screen has decided to come back on me. And now you can see this is what the CarPlay looks like. This is, of course, the wireless CarPlay that you have uh, with the vehicle. It also includes wireless Android Auto. The screen looks good when it's actually working. So I'm pretty impressed with how this actually looks. I like how the icons are nice and large. You can literally um, see everything really well. The resolution is amazing. It's very crystal clear. You can also push this little button here and you can make the icons a little bit smaller. Although then it creates this kind of blank space here, which doesn't expand the CarPlay screen. Uh, Ford says you cannot actually take up the entire screen with CarPlay. That is due to an Apple thing, not necessarily a Ford thing. You can see here also the um, cards have also come back here at the bottom. Earlier um, when I was driving this vehicle, the trip computer decided to go away and the Radio. The actual radio decided to go to go away. The card actually went away. I couldn't bring it back up. You can see when you go here to the trip computer, this also shows you where your energy went on your trips. It shows you your kilowatt hours. Uh, it shows you, you know, what's draining the battery. You can see in this 24 degree temperature, it's it's saying that 9% of the power is going to the outside temperature. Going back over here, you can see there's your CarPlay populating again. It looks all very nice when you put the car into reverse. Um, the reverse camera system works well. You can see it's got a full 360 camera. Doesn't take up the entire screen, but this is really what I was hoping to show you guys. And I'm really happy that it decided to come back uh, and the cars decided to come back as well. So anytime you go over here, you can see it gives you all your different shortcuts to get to all your usual places and whatnot. Um, if you just tap the Waze here, Waze will actually pull up and pull directly from the CarPlay, which is very nice. Um, going over back to the car icon, you can see all your different sources over there. Uh, so when the system is working, I am relatively impressed with Ford's Sync 3 system or Sync 4A system. It's been tailored, of, of course, exclusively for this. It's still a little bit slow and laggy. Uh, I like how the climate controls are down here. When you push that, you can see there, it brings you all your, your usual climate control settings. Um, and you can see here, without a heat pump, you have to use the actual e-heat. That's kind of similar to what um, you know, other electric vehicles do without an actual heat pump. But overall, very bright screen, beautiful looking graphics, very large display as well. It, it complements with this 10 and a quarter inch display. But really Ford just needs to get their act together and making sure that this system is working properly, especially when it gets into the hands of owners. Down here, you can see there's your climate control settings. Um, you have an automatic setting, you have dual zone climate control, you have your heated steering wheel, your heated seat controls. There's also an automatic function, of course. Um, the fact that it's in the actual screen requires you to take your eyes off the road. And then of course down here, you can also just push that button there, which will turn on and off the audio. And this the Ford actually gave us a dedicated volume knob there, which is nice, which is something you don't get again in a lot of Tesla models. Now down over here in the center stack, you can see there's a wireless phone charger. This is my iPhone 12 Pro Max. It basically fits perfectly in there, but for some reason my phone wasn't charging very well. You have two cup holders over here, some more piano black plastic trim. This shifter here, I'm not a fan of. The one thing I don't like about the shifter when I go and go to drive, there's no stopping point. I can basically keep turning over to the right or turning over to the left. I wish Ford kind of gave us a stopping point to show that I'm at park or I'm at drive. There's also a low mode here. Remember, this is a single speed reduction gear transmission. So it doesn't actually have any gears. The low mode's gonna kind of basically increase the regenerative braking, which the system already kind of gives you that when you're actually driving the vehicle in the one pedal drive mode. Now, another mode I forgot to show you, if you push the little Mustang logo there, it shows you all your little shortcuts for the apps and whatnot. So this is kind of like your home screen. You can see Waze is already built into the system there, which it would work if the CarPlay was working. So again, that's going to be something that uh, Ford's gonna have to fix over the years. Looking at the center console here, you can see this is a nice padded leather area. If I open this up, there's a 12 volt outlet there. There's two USB charging ports over there. This is pretty deep. There's a good amount of storage and I can also close that up if I wanna cover up the storage itself. Uh, looking over here at the glove compartment, you can see it is a pretty decent size. It's damped, but not lined with felt. And then above me, you can see right here, the massive panoramic glass roof, which does not open, but you can see it's very dark tinted. So even though there is no shade, I find that the sun that did come in was very mild and it's very similar to what I experienced in a lot of Tesla models. So again, overall the interior of this vehicle is very modern. It's very open, it's very airy, it's very minimalistic. And I also like a lot of the tech features that Ford is giving you. Uh, and the Bang & Olsen stereo sounds pretty impressive. This is a stereo that you get on the upper trims of the Mach-E. Now getting into the rear seat of the Mach-E, remember this is the first ever Mustang that actually has a back or back doors. Mustangs have always had a back seat, but this actually has back doors. Now getting back here, I'm actually surprised to say that it is fairly roomy in here and there's a 
pretty good amount of headroom because of that trickery that Ford did with the actual roof line of this vehicle. You can see the panoramic glass roof adds in so much light. And in terms of the actual space, Ford says there's around 38 inches of legroom back here, which is about the same as the last Model Y that I tested. Although in the real world, I think the Tesla offers a little bit more space. Uh, although this is kind of, you know, gonna come down to how often you're gonna use the rear seat of this vehicle. Now in terms of the materials, it's the same as the front. You have the soft touch materials with that more of that active X, the contrasting stitching. You have rear seat air vents back here. You have two USB-C, or two USB ports, one USB-C, one USB-A port. And then there's also two map pockets here. Now, one thing I'm also noticing, no heated rear seats. It would have been nice if Ford included that. You can get that on a Tesla Model Y. And then the seats themselves, they fold down, but they also give you this nice cup holder here. So if you need to sit two across, it is fairly comfortable to do so. Uh, now, getting in and out of the vehicle is also quite interesting. Um, Ford, instead of giving you a traditional door handle, there's actually a lever right here at the door that you kind of just pull, and that gives you a mechanical uh, lever to actually open and close the door, which is much preferred if you guys pr uh, want that as opposed to the electronic mechanism that you get on some competitors. So I have definitely been waiting quite a while to drive the all new 2021 Ford Mach-E. And when Ford first showed this vehicle off at the LA Auto Show um, about two years ago, I was pretty impressed with the design. I think it's a much better looking car versus the Model Y, which again, I consider to be a true competitor to this vehicle. And it's one of the reasons why the Mach-E I think is going to do extremely well. Now, obviously there are some mixed feelings about the name of this vehicle, having the Mustang badge attached to it. But I actually kind of like the fact that there is no you know, Ford badges all over this car. It's essentially more just part of the Mustang, you know, co-brand within Ford. Uh, and this brand or this nameplate has a lot of history for the company. Obviously, I mentioned earlier, it is one of the longest running nameplate vehicles on the road. This Mach-E in general gets so much attention on the road, especially from the younger generation. That is who Ford is targeting because clearly they need to engage with younger buyers, which ironically is the drive mode that I have it in right now. But I'm gonna switch it over to unbridled, which is the sport driving mode for this vehicle. And this is, remember, the dual motor non or the dual motor extended range battery, but not the GT version. So we've got nearly 350 horsepower. I'm just gonna floor it from a stop. This is my first time doing so. And it creates a fake engine noise that I actually don't mind the noise. This is something that you don't really hear in some Tesla models. <laughs> and it feels very impressive, very instantaneous in terms of electric motor torque. This is what you expect from an EV, especially from Tesla. You really feel the torque shove you back in the seat. Now, from a start, I did notice it's not quite as fast as I would like it to be. Uh, now, I haven't had much experience in some non-performance Teslas, only the performance models, which are just brutal off the line. That's what I'm expecting the GT to feel like when I first finally drive that later this summer. But this is very, very impressive. So <laughs> it has plenty of power. And I think this is going to impress a lot of people who have never driven an EV. And I also like the fact that this car has the one pedal driving function where it's got essentially the very strong regen braking, but Ford also does a very good job of blending the brakes, uh, which is something that Teslas don't really do. If I lift off the throttle, you can feel it regening the brakes uh, the car in itself feels relatively heavy, actually. Remember, this is a nearly 5,000 pound SUV. So in terms of the handling, as I go into these corners here, I am noticing the Mach-E does actually corner very well. It feels of like a very well-balanced car because remember, the battery packs are mounted low in the vehicle, uh, creating essentially just like a skateboard platform, uh, making the center of gravity very low. The steering is also quite sharp, communicative, uh, and stable and just very quick ratio. So this very much feels like a full electric car that will surprise a lot of people. I mean, yes, take away the Mustang badge and it's a wonderful EV. The Mustang badge puts some expectations on it, but also gets it some nice press that it's going to need to compete against Tesla. You can see going around this corner here, very little body lean. I'm very impressed how there's very little body lean in this thing. And because of the, the battery packs, it just doesn't feel tippy like an, an SUV usually would. So that's very impressive that uh, Ford is able to do that. I mean, you can feel that they spent the money. You can feel that they did a dedicated platform for this vehicle. Now, again, I'm just gonna try it from a stop here. <laughs> yeah, 4.8 seconds. Feels more like a five second car. It feels pretty quick. I'm, I'm very impressed with how quick this car feels. <laughs> very, very impressive. So 
I, it gets me excited to drive the GT version. I am so looking forward to driving the GT version of this car because I think it's going to be the one that is truly going to tempt people to not buy a Tesla performance model. This is one fun driving vehicle for sure. <laughs> and because of that all-wheel drive, there is very little to no wheel slip in this car. Just like a Tesla, it just feels sure-footed, planted, visibility is good, and the ride quality in this car is also really good. I'm surprised at how well it rides. Even with the 19-inch wheels, I've got somewhat skinnier 225 wood tires. These aren't, you know, performance-oriented tires. The GT version will have fatter 245 wood 20s. These are a 19-inch design. But you know what, I'm gonna take this car on a longer highway trip. We're gonna tire the range out because right now it's showing an 89% battery. I'm gonna drive it around 114 miles and we're gonna check back on the highway and see how this thing performs when we get it out on the road and see how the range actually fares in the real world. So I'm on my way down to Virginia to go meet my videographer to film this thing. And I wanna give you guys an update really quick on the mileage and the range. Now, uh, I did get stuck behind some traffic earlier. Um, so I wasn't able to go like the normal 75 on this route. I was going maybe like 55 for a bit. Um, but now I'm, traffic has finally cleared up and I'm able to set a cruise at like 75 miles an hour. Um, we've gone a total of 41 miles and the charge remaining is at 149. I'm at 71% battery. Remember when I started the trip, I was going, or I was at 89% battery. So it's used uh, about 18% of the charge to go the last 40 miles or so. Uh, it's averaging around 2.6 miles per kilowatt. Um, remember this car has a 270 mile range, but when they dropped it off, it had around an 80 uh, or 90% charge. Um, because they did have to drive it to my house, of course. So I'll give you guys updates uh, later on on the range uh, through the social channels and what the thing's showing is a full charge. I'm, I remember some of my colleagues saying that they get around, uh, they're showing around 200 and uh, 30 or 40 miles on a full charge. Remember, Ford's computer is very conservative. Unlike Tesla's, which is very optimistic, this is going to consistently look at my driving style, um, my the traffic conditions, the temperatures outside, the climate control settings, like even this car shows you this cool little thing here where it shows you where your energy is going. Um, so it says here 80% of the energy went to the driving route, 11% to climate use. Remember, it's 30 degrees out here. So unlike some of those reviewers who are testing the cars in California, where they have beautiful 70 degree weather out there, uh, I'm here in Pennsylvania on my way to Virginia and, I'm, and it's 30 degrees outside. We're expecting a, like eight inches of snow tomorrow. Um, so they're doing some salt treatment on the road. Now it looks like the mileage has gone up to 2.7. So this is actually pretty good. This is very comparable to my Tesla Model 3. I haven't had a chance to do a longer range test on a Model Y, but if you guys look at the EPA numbers, this is rated at 90 MPGE, which is about 30% less efficient uh, versus the Tesla Model Y. So, you know, I'll give you guys updates as we go into the, you know, longer part of this trip. I still have around 75 more miles to go before I get to my destination. The one thing I do want to talk about before I forget, this car has wireless CarPlay, and look at this. Frustratingly, it is not working. Even if I plugged my phone and even when I have it connected to the wireless CarPlay, it is not working right now and that is very frustrating. I've been trying my best to get it to come back on. Um, Alex on Autos told me if I push the talk button here and then hit cancel, it, it sometimes will come back, but nothing. Uh, I've tried resetting my phone, nothing. So that is very frustrating. I can't tell if it's Ford's Sync 4 system or if it's CarPlay. So Ford won't tell us, or Ford likes to point the fingers at Apple, whereas Apple will probably point the fingers back at Ford. So just some you know minor kinks that have to be worked out. I'm not surprised the Ford Sync system has always been a little bit glitchy, a little bit buggy, and this is still a little bit too slow. It doesn't work quite as well as Tesla's, but hey, at least it has CarPlay. That's something that Tesla doesn't have, but it would be nice if it actually worked on this longer trip. In terms of highway driving, I have it on Ford's Copilot 360 2.0. It has adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist. All of that is standard, which is kind of similar to Tesla's enhanced autopilot. Although I will say I have it engaged right now. It doesn't quite keep in the lane or turn quite as well as Tesla systems. You can see it is turning on this very gentle curve for me right now. Um, but anything sharper than this, and I found that it struggles a little bit. I don't feel like I can trust it completely. It doesn't have any auto lane change functions or anything like that, and now it's telling me to keep my hands back on the wheel. Um, Ford does ship this car with an active drive prep package, which is basically similar to Cadillac Super Cruise or GM Super Cruise. That is not yet available, but Ford says they're going to be able to wirelessly over the air update the vehicle. Uh, it already has the hardware built in where you can 
It'll basically drive hands-free on certain interstates thanks to LiDAR and radar and of course in the camera system. Right now it just has their adaptive cruise control function which, which works pretty much as well as every other manufacturer but not quite as well as Tesla's enhanced autopilot system. The other thing I'm also noticing, EVs are also eerily quiet because there's no engine noise. And this car uh, is relatively quiet. It has a very aerodynamic shape, but I am hearing some wind noise at 75 miles per hour. It's pretty similar to, you know, the last Tesla, Tesla vehicle I drove, including my Model 3. Um, I'll take it off cruise control here. I just want to test out the acceleration. I have it in just engage mode, which is the normal mode when I floor it here. It does have plenty of acceleration and you can hear the noise. It creates that fake engine sound, which I don't hate it. It kind of tries to sound like a V6. I would have preferred something like what Audi does where it has that futuristic George Jetson electric motor whir. This is more like a whir, like a fake engine noise. It's not bad, but you know, you can turn that off if you guys don't like it. I also really like the one pedal drive feature, which is very strong and similar to Tesla. It'll bring the vehicle down to a complete stop without even having to touch the brakes. The brakes do get a little touchy if you guys uh, actually do need to use the friction brakes. I found that when I had to do a few emergency stops, it was a little bit jerky at times. So as I get to the end of my trip here, I have about eight miles left and the battery is at 40% remaining. Remember when I started this drive, I had around 89, 90% of charge uh, and I was showing around 193 miles. We have gone a total of 110 miles basically and it's showing 88 miles left. So this has been bang on with the trip computer's estimation of range. This is much more accurate versus what I find in a lot of Tesla models. Tesla would show, you know, 300 miles of range on a full charge. However, in the real world, you were getting around 240, 250 miles of range. Of course, that depends on how you drive. It depends on how hard you're accelerating. It depends on the conditions outside. It depends on whether you're using the climate control settings. Now I will say that the Mach-E lacks a heat pump and I believe this car could be much more efficient if Ford added a heat pump, especially in these, you know, 30 degree temperatures right now that I'm experiencing. It does suck up more energy and I bet you Ford could probably recover back at least 15% of the efficiency compared to a Model Y if they added that. So Ford, hopefully you have plans to add a heat pump to the Mach-E in the coming years. But I will say with 88 miles left of range um, and 40% charge, I'm not necessarily feeling range anxiety just because I know that Electrify America and EVgo has plenty of charging stations uh, within a 10 mile radius of where I am. Um, so that's kind of, you know, how the charging infrastructure has grown over the years. You know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't dare take, you know, a 111 mile road trip in an electric car, but now you can kind of do it, do it without even breaking a sweat. And I have to say the Mach-E has been a really nice partner to do it in. These seats, these ActiveX seats remind me of the last Tesla Model 3 and Model Y that I drove. They're very comfortable. The fake leather material also feels very nice. The ride quality of this vehicle is on the firmer side of comfortable. Um, it is definitely firmer, but not quite as harsh as a regular Mustang. Speaking of which, this does this car even drive like a Mustang? Does it remind me of a Mustang? The answer is no, it doesn't drive like a Mustang at all. But I can understand why the Ford marketing department wanted to utilize this name because the Mustang name, the badging, uh, of this vehicle. It's just so much more interesting versus Ford. And I think that's what Ford was trying to do. They wanted to attract, they will attract a younger new audience to their brand with this vehicle. And there's a reason why they did it. I mean, yes, the old petrol heads who you know grew up driving Mustangs in the 60s and 70s and 80s, this is not going to satisfy you. However, for my generation, for the millennials, for the Gen Zs, uh, for the generation after that, this is a car that shows that Ford is serious about the rebirth of the Mustang brand into the electrification world. Uh, and it really puts Tesla and other electric car companies on notice because Ford, a mainstream legacy auto manufacturer, did develop an EV. It shows that when they put their mind to it, they can develop an EV that is world class, that will seriously start attracting a different audience to the brand. I'm pretty pleased with this car. It gets me super excited to drive the Mach-E GT because this model, <laughs> While it is quick, the enthusiast in me wants it to be even faster, which is where the GT model comes in. 
So for the longest time, I was pretty skeptical of electric vehicles until I went out and purchased a Tesla Model 3 Performance on my own. And I owned that vehicle for around two years. And to be honest, I drive a lot of cars over the years and I actually miss driving it and owning it. So I'm really on the lookout for another all electric vehicle. So when Ford announced the all electric version of the Mustang dubbed the Mach-E, I was very excited for this vehicle because I wanted to drive and buy a competing vehicle that wasn't a Tesla. As you guys know, the Tesla Rati folks can be a crazy pe bunch of people to deal with at times because Tesla drivers and enthusiasts are so obsessed with the brand, but it's pretty easy to see why after owning a Tesla, and I have to say after spending a couple days with the all new Ford Mach-E, I can dare I say it, this is a true competitor to Tesla. And really they do that because it's a vehicle that from has been designed from the ground up to be a battery electric car. This is no compliance electric vehicle like you see on the old Ford C-Max or the Ford Focus electric. And after spending a week, I found plenty to like about this car. It's comfortable, it's easy to drive. The range is actually, uh, as stated, a true factor, a true number that isn't kind of optimistic the way Tesla is with their range. And also I found the power of the extended range dual motor version to be quite sufficient. I mean, this is gonna get you to 60 in around five seconds, which is pretty much what every buyer, every driver is going to want. And for those of you who want a little bit more, this car gets me super excited to drive the GT version, which will be around a second and a half quicker zero to 60 wise. It won't have quite as much range uh, as the a Tesla Model Y, but really what Ford has done here is they developed an electric car that gets me excited for the next generation of electric vehicles. It also looks significantly better than a Tesla Model Y. And it also got a lot of attention. Remember, this is an electric SUV that has the Mustang badge on it. And even though a lot of Mustang faithful are upset about the fact that Ford put a Mustang badge on it, it makes it want to, or it makes people want to talk about this car. And that's kind of the whole reason for it. Ford wanted this vehicle to get a lot of attention in the media. And that's exactly what it does with the Mustang badge on it and the styling of this vehicle. Now, speaking of which, if you guys are looking to buy an all new Mach-E, this is going to start at around $43,000 for a base standard range rear wheel drive select version at around $4,000 for the premium trim package, which is my tester. Now, if you guys want the extended range battery, I highly recommend that if you plan to do a lot of road trips, it's going to add $5,000 more. And if you want all wheel drive, which adds an extra motor, that's going to cost around $2,700 more. Now my tester here with the white exterior color stickers for a grand total of $55,000. Remember this comes standard with Ford's Copilot 360. 2.0 and that makes it a little bit more expensive versus a Tesla Model Y but remember the Mach-E qualifies for the $7,500 federal tax credit which as of this filming Tesla does not qualify anymore although that could change if the a bill that the Biden administration has submitted decides to pass through legislation but we'll have to wait and see if that actually happens now at $55,000 this is actually kind of a bargain you know after you minus the $7,500 tax credit keep in mind if you guys want to go for a full-on GT version those will start at around $60,000 I imagine the Mach-E EGT with the performance package will come in around $65,000. That'll go on sale, of course, this summer, which I'm really excited to drive because this car truly surprised me. It's one of my favorite new electric vehicles that I've driven all year long. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the 2021 Ford Mach-E extended range battery with the dual motor all wheel drive. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews. Like us on Facebook. And as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.